We're going to move on. Uh, actually, the, uh, the closing remark that Jay just mentioned, the new administration, new party, and I also worked for a Republican administration, um, uh, Republican Governor uh, Mitt Romney. The um, Commonwealth is overwhelmingly Democratic in its voting records and its legislature. Um, but it's intriguing to see that some of the most interesting work that's been done on the issues that we're all wrestling with here today um, has happened without uh, regard to which political party was in charge. Um, they really are not um, partisan issues, uh, smart growth, sustainable <laughs> development, um, climate resiliency, the things that we're going to all be wrestling with. There really, there is not a partisan element to it. There's, Washington may uh, suggest otherwise, but in this state, we have a long history of dealing with these issues, regardless of the party in power, or certainly the, regardless of the governor, going back um, generations. Uh, Frank Sargent, who chaired my nonprofit, uh, uh, the Conservation Law Foundation that I headed for years, Frank Sargent was the first chairman I recruited and served under. He was a Republican governor in this state that created the first environmental agency in this state, headed it. Um, Bill Weld was a Republican governor, um, and you now have Charlie Baker, uh, uh, um, Mitt Romney, and others. So uh, the next speaker, uh, uh, Chuck Marone, is, uh, as you can see from the material that you've already received, his background, um, a remarkable uh, uh, effort to create a nonprofit that deals with these issues in a very nonpartisan way um, and addresses the question, the interface between infrastructure, transportation, investment, investment generally in communities, and their economic vitality and their sustainable development. Um, Strong Towns is, uh, I've admired it. It's going to be a treat for me to hear. Um, Chuck's remarks, because I've admired his work from afar for some time. If you go on the website, you see all sorts of really in interesting thought and, um, and leadership on these issues. So uh, the next speaker, uh, we're going to have a similar format, let Chuck um, present his remarks to you. Um, I'll hang out in the back so I can get a cup of coffee while we go, and then we'll open it up for questions and interaction amongst all of you. So Chuck, welcome to Boston. No, it's very nice to be here. In Minnesota, we like to fashion ourselves as, uh, as having a good uh, mix across parties as well. So I, I think you guys have been a model in some ways. I, I want to, before I get into, and I, I know my stuff is in here somewhere, um, before I get into the stuff that I brought, I, I wanted to give you uh, a little story about my work as an engineer to kind of follow up on the, uh, the director's remarks. Um, there was a, a city, I, I'm a civil engineer. Uh, when I was a young engineer starting out, this city called, uh, the, name, the name of the city was Reamer, R-E-M-E-R. -E the only palindrome in the state was their claim to fame. Uh, 250 people. They called the office and they said, we're, we're getting fined by the pollution control agency. Would someone uh, come and help us? And the call went out and looked around the table and nobody wanted to go to this little town, you know, an hour and a half away, uh, except for the young engineer that, you know, was, was enthusiastic. So I went up there, did a big study of their system. Uh, what the problem was, was they had 300 feet of pipe. Uh, this is what I discovered. There's 300 feet of pipe underneath a state highway that water was leaking into. And this water was ending up in their sewage treatment facility and was going to overflow their ponds. And it was a, it was a big mess. And they were getting fined $10,000 uh, by the Pollution Control Agency because of this. Now, their entire city budget was $80,000. So this was a, you know, a significant deal for them. Uh, I came up with a solution. Uh, we were going to have to directional bore underneath this highway and replace this pipe. It was going to cost $300,000. I went back to them. I was very proud of the work that I had done. I'd figured out this elegant solution. We just fixed this little bit of pipe and, and we'll be good to go. They said, well, this is wonderful, Chuck, but we don't have $300,000. There's no way we could get 300, you know, we can't, you're gonna have to go get a grant or figure out something else. So I went back to the office, consulted with my elders, and they sent me to different grant agencies to, to look at programs. And the word I got back was, Chuck, this is maintenance, we don't do maintenance. This is really too small for us. We don't do projects of this size. 
you know, we're, we, we really can't help you. I'm a smart guy, right? I go back to the city. I say, I'll tell you what we need to do. Uh, we need to make this project a lot bigger. Um, is there anybody who's not served today by the system? Let's get them connected. Uh, can we come up with an area where we could possibly have an a industrial park in the future? Let's get that set up. We wound up uh, doubling the size of the treatment facility, putting in two additional miles of pipe, and making it a $2.6 million project. Went back to the funding agencies, and they loved it. They loved it. They said, this is a fantastic project. Not only do you have a pending environmental catastrophe, we can check off that box, but you also have economic development potential. Uh, you've got, you're helping impoverished populations. All the checklists were now you know, checked off because of this project. Uh, the city received from the state and federal government uh, 2.4 plus million dollars in grant uh, they did have to pay of this total project cost 130000 themselves, but it was financed for them by the USDA over 40 years. This was back in 2000. Okay, so this was 15 years ago. Uh, they were ecstatic, right? They had Chuck Marone Day at the city. They literally had a party for me. Uh, you know, I saved the city, right? Did I save the city? I solved their problem, right? But what did I really do? I took a system that was too big for them to maintain. It was beyond their capacity to even do basic maintenance on. And I doubled the size of it. That's what I did. I've been back there. It's a, you know, when, when they took the vote to take out this 40-year loan back by the USDA, there wasn't a single council member who was less than 60 years old. That means statistically, none of them will be around to see that debt paid off, right? I mean, hopefully they will, but you know, not very likely. This is systematically what we've done to small towns all over the country, over and over and over in, in, in uh, our pursuit of economic growth. So let me start with that as kind of a backdrop of my experience and my background. I, I left the engineering profession, I didn't leave, I, I kind of went and got a planning degree, started doing planning for a number of years, and then started writing this blog because none of it made any sense to me. And uh, the blog took off, and now I am running this nonprofit uh, trying to share this message. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about transportation policy, I'm going to talk a little bit about economic growth and development, and then uh, we'll leave plenty of time at the end to chat. Um, this is our mission. We're about uh, a model of growth that allows our places to become financially strong and resilient. Uh, I want to have you think about all the needs that we have in our transportation system today. We have people saying we need repairs, we've got congestion, we've got safety issues, we have to make these strategic economic development investments and we just don't have enough money to do this. We have all these demands in our systems. We have this generation of people entering retirement. We have this new generation of young people. They have different transportation wants and needs than prior generations. We've got to solve these, but we, we don't have the money to do it. We have all these things we want to do. We want to build great transit systems. We want to build great bus networks, walking, biking, all this stuff, and we just don't have the money. What is the obvious solution to this myriad of problems, right? We need more money very clear this is the this is the problem and if you look at the the conversation going on in Washington DC right now about transportation in state capitals all over the country it settles on this issue how do we get more money because our fundamental problem is that we don't have enough money to do all the stuff that we need to do the American Society of Civil Engineers at the federal level said in order for us to meet our current obligations in funding our transportation system, we need to spend an additional $94 billion a year above and beyond what we're now spending. Uh, for some context for that, our current gas tax is 18.4 cents a gallon. There's talk about indexing that to inflation. It's not been raised since 1993. Had we indexed to, a, to inflation in 1993, the gas tax would be a little less than 30 cents a gallon. We asked the question, all right, what if we had indexed it to GDP growth? We would be around 30 cents a gallon. What if we had indexed it to traffic growth, like the actual demand and increase in the number of, of miles being driven? That would be around 24 cents a gallon. But what if we were going to raise the gas tax to meet the American Society of Civil Engineers number, uh, what they're saying we're going to need 
to fund our current system. That would be around 78 cents a gallon. 78 cents a gallon is not going to happen, right? It's not going to happen. And so the question really is, if we don't have the money, what then? If we don't have the money to do everything that we've got in the plan, everything that we want to do, everything that needs to be done to build the system the way we're going about doing it today, what do we do then? This is the interstate system as it was envisioned during the Great Depression. During the Great Depression, uh, planners understood at the federal level that the automobile was becoming a force. It was going to be transformational in our economy. They sat down and they, they drew this out. And, and I understand here in the Northeast, you might not grasp the hubris of this plan. If you've ever driven across Nebraska or Texas, you, you, this is a vast, vast country. The hubris behind building something this massive is, is, is unthinkable, right? This is huge. Yet, we built this, and then we created a system to build more and more and more. This is what our current federal highway system looks like. Uh, this is just the federal system now. This isn't the state system, the regional system, the local systems. This is just the federal system. Uh, more and more and more. The American Society of Civil Engineers a couple years ago put out a report that said, uh, if we don't spend enough money on our transportation system, our families and businesses are going to suffer a trillion dollars of losses between 2012 and 2020. In order to avoid those losses, the state report recommended that we spend $2.2 trillion. Uh, the ASCE had in that report, uh, if we fail to make the transportation investments needed to fully maintain and fund our transportation system, and they called it at the lowest adequate level. So this is not like every bell and whistle. This is just bare kind of maintenance. The federal government would lose $540 billion of revenue between 2012 and 2040. In order to avoid that revenue loss, the American Society of Civil Engineers recommends we spend $6.6 .6 trillion. Now, you would be right to say, Chuck, this seems really crazy. Can I trust you and your numbers? Like, why would they put out a report that said this? Of course, they didn't write it like this, right? Like any good propaganda report, the big number, trillion dollars of losses was at the beginning, you know, huge losses in GDP growth. And then the, the, the amount we had to spend was just this small amount every year, right? Unfortunately for ASCE, some of us can do math, uh, multiply one number by the other. That's where we come up with this. And if this sounds really crazy, let me show you actually what some of these projects look like. This is Highway 91 in California. Highway 91 is about to get two additional lanes because they have congestion problems. The cost of this would be $1.4 billion. Here's what was reported as part of the, uh, the project documents. The project, this $1.4 billion project, will give some relief to drivers in the regular lanes, raising their average rush hour speeds from 8 miles per hour to 9.4 miles per hour. These are the kind of projects that our system is kicking out now and saying this is, the, this is what we need to spend $1.4 billion on. We built the interstate system, and we continued to build and build and build. And we have this, this approach right now that is focused on building, building, building more. And we've not only reached the bottom of the barrel, but we've dug deep, 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 right? Let me ask you a, a, a theoretical, like rhetorical question. If you have an affluent society, a society with means and, and, and a certain level of affluence, and you're facing an urgent, critical, existential problem, is your reaction going to be to step back, rethink your assumptions, explore alternatives, ask some really hard questions, or are you more likely to just take some of your affluence and throw at the problem, right? I think we all understand what we have been doing for decades. We need more money is what we're being told today. But the reality is that we've run out of money. As Ernest Rutherford, a British physicist, said, we've run out of money. It's time to start thinking, right? It's time to step back and evaluate and rethink some of those assumptions. What I want to do today for the rest of time is, is help you do that. Uh, because many of you are working at the local levels, working in cities, trying to make things work. And very much like me years ago, this system doesn't make sense to you. It's telling you to you know, put in double the size of your sewage treatment facility when you can't maintain 300 feet. 
it's enticing you to do things that don't make sense. So I want to help you kind of pull back the curtain and see a little bit behind and understand that this system, you're not crazy, and you can do something about it. I want to start with this. This is the fundamental uh, building block of how we build our transportation network today. This is the uh, hierarchical road network. Small local streets, dead-end cul-de-sacs, go into larger collector streets, go into arterials, go into major arterials. We understand this. This is how our transportation system is built today. You can go to any system in the, uh, any city in the country and they will have a hierarchical road network somewhere, uh, a map showing what theirs is. I want you to think of a river and what a river is like. We all intuitively understand river networks. You have small little ditches that flow into streams, that flow into larger rivers, that flow into you know, major uh, rivers. We all in understand that when it rains kind of in a persistent way out on the edge, what happens in the center? We get flooding, right? And we understand this intuitively, so we have done things like, say, you can't fill wetlands, you can't run things off directly into rivers, you have to retain water uh, on the site. We, we, we take all these very logical steps because we know this flooding is really destructive and really horrible, and this is part of how these systems work. Yet, when we take that same river and we make it a road network, which is exactly what the hierarchical network is, and we have rain of a different sort out on the periphery, somehow we're absolutely shocked and astounded when we get flooding in, you know, in a center tributary, right? Somehow we just don't understand why this happens. And we can look and say, yeah, we get a little bit of economic growth out on the edge when we make these investments, but of course in the center, we're seeing just catastrophic levels of expense, not only in lost time uh, commuting, and you know, energy loss and, and, and what have you, but the reconstruction costs in these places are just massively, massively disruptive and prohibitive. This is the system that we have built. This is the system that we have engineered. And because we have created a system that literally manufactures congestion out of nothing, it takes little bits of congestion and manufactures it to maximize the amount of congestion in one place, our engineering profession has become congestion adverse, right? So we overestimate habitually how much traffic we're gonna actually see. This is a projection from out in Washington State. Uh, they did uh, a highway improvement. They projected what the traffic would be in 1996. They projected what it would be uh, again in 2002. And again in 2011, they projected what they thought traffic would do. Those are all the up. Going down is actually what traffic has done. There's less traffic than they had anticipated. We see this over and over. This is an aggregate of all the state DOT's traffic projections since 1999. Every year they project steadily have huge increases in traffic, yet traffic doesn't go up like that, right? We do this because we've created a system that manufactures congestion, and congestion uh, is the enemy. This causes us to spend massive amounts of money over designing and over building our systems. And if you sit down with your engineering department today or you go to the state DOT and you say, what do we, they will come to you with this massive traffic projection of what needs to happen. We need to acquire property, widen roads, do all kinds of crazy stuff. And you wind up in situations very much like this. Think for a second about what is going on in your city at rush hour, right? We have this system that manufactures congestion, that puts as much congestion as possible in one place. Yet if you could float up 10,000 feet and just look at all the acres and acres of asphalt that you have around the entire place, you see that most of it is empty. Most of it is not being used at any one time. It is pretty difficult to call a system efficient or optimized when the vast amount of pavement that you have is not being used at your peak time. This would be, in a sense, as if the airline industries were to size their fleets based on the demand they had at Thanksgiving and Christmas, and then essentially flew empty planes the other days of the year, right? We, we, would, we would think that that was an insane strategy, yet that is our absolute strategy for how we handle transportation in this country. You guys have, in this part of the world, uh, a, a far more developed rail network than we have 
in, in, you know, where I come from in Minnesota or most other parts of the country. Uh, do you pay the same rate when you want to ride the train during rush hour that you would, you know, late at night? Of course not, right? We all get this. Yet, when we look at the way we build our transportation system, as engineers, we design it for the peak capacity. We, we assume everybody will be on the road for one period of time, and it's our like moral obligation to handle that. This is an insane strategy from an economic standpoint. One of the other things that goes along with this then is this notion of forgiving design. And this really gets into the way we engineer uh, in a detailed level within our cities. Uh, back when we started building the interstate system, uh, we didn't understand what high performance vehicles would do on high performance roadways. And one of the things that happened is that a lot of people died because roads were built in those days very much like cart paths were built in the generation before. You would get to a tree and you wouldn't cut down the tree, you would go around the tree, right? Which worked fine when you're in a cart and buggy, but when you're in an automobile that's capable of going 60 miles an hour and you maybe have a moment of inattention, the tree does not yield to you when you go through it, right? So what engineers figured out is that we can anticipate and forgive with our design approach a number of very predictable mistakes that people will make. And so we started to do this. We said, all right, you've got a regular two-lane road. Uh, we know that sometimes people look down and change the radio station, look in the back seat at the kids. They're going to float a little bit. So if we got to make the lanes a little bit wider. So if they float, they don't float over into the other lane and hit another car, right? So we, we widened out the lanes. And then we said, you know, sometimes people go off the road. Sometimes they float a little bit more. Uh, we got to have some wider shoulders so there's some recovery room. So if people go off the road, they're not, you know, going to lose control. Then we said if they, you know, even at this point, some people still are going to wind up going off the road in a catastrophic way. So we need to get rid of those obstacles out on the road. So you wind up with what is a very, very safe type of approach for automobiles. Uh, this has saved millions of lives. This thinking, this logic, this approach has saved millions and millions of lives on our highways. The problem is, as we all kind of intuitively understand, when we take this thought process of forgiving design, and this is particularly pernicious in our small towns, uh, you see some of the wealthy neighborhoods here in Boston would not tolerate this, right? We came in and said, you know, we're going to widen this out and take out this road. It doesn't, doesn't happen. But in our small towns, it happens all the time. Uh, when we take these forgiving design approaches and bring them into the city, we all understand what happens, right? We all understand what happens. The speeds go way, way, way up, far greater than what is safe. Uh, I pointed out last week on our blog, uh, you know, as engineers, we design these uh, intricate breakaway systems. If you ever are walking down the street and you look at a, a light uh, or a traffic signal, look at the base of it, you'll see these kind of double bolts there. It's a breakaway so that if a vehicle hits it, it won't stay solid. It will actually give and absorb the shock so that people won't get hurt uh, when they hit these things. It's called a breakaway. And you just noted that um, when you put, build a breakaway structure and you put it in a sidewalk, you're saying something about the value of what's on that sidewalk, right? We know cars go off the street. We know when we design things, over-engineer them so people drive really, really fast, uh, they're going to go off the street. We understand this so intuitively that we put, you know, thousands of dollars on a light additional to have breakaway structures. Yet, you know, I guess people are breakaway in a sense, but they're not as replaceable as uh, traffic signals are, right? Uh, this is what we've done in our cities, and it has a pernicious effect not only on people, but on property values. If you need a sign to tell people to slow down, uh, you designed your street wrong. And in city after city after city, we see these kind of things deployed, reminding people that they should drive slow on streets that we have over-engineered and over-designed for them to drive fast. This is something we call a strode. A strode is a street road hybrid. We call this the futon of transportation. Uh, if you think of, 
a futon as being an uncomfortable couch that makes into an uncomfortable bed. A strode is a type of investment that tries to do two things at once and does neither of them well. It tries to be both street and road. Uh, wh what is the difference? A road is a high-speed connection between two places. If you think of a road as a replacement of a railroad, like a road on rails, in a railroad you would get on in one spot, you would get off in another spot, and you would have a high-speed connection between the two. We didn't have frontage railroads, we didn't have drive-through railroads, it was just a high-speed connection. And if you look at this, we have put the, you know, the money invested here to make this a high-speed corridor. We've made four lanes, two lanes in each direction. They're wide, highway-scale lanes for very fast movement. We put in a center turn lane so that you know, the turning traffic can get out of the way so the through traffic can just go through unhindered. Does anyone get to drive through here quickly? No. Why? Because you've got a signal that makes people stop. You've got low speed limits. And so even though we've made the investment to make this a really high-performing, fast road, it doesn't function that way. What is a street? A street is, and always has been, a platform for building wealth. It is a platform for building wealth within a community. When we look at this, we've made investments to make this a real wealthy street. We put in wide sidewalks, we put in decorative lights, we hang out banners, we put in planters and benches. We made all these things to make it a, a really great street. Is, is this a real wealth creating street? No, if I'm shopping here and I wanna shop over here, I'm not likely to you know, walk down here, wait for the signal, come over, come up. I'm not likely to go you know, across seven lanes and jaywalk. What am I likely to do? I'm likely to get in my car, whip a U-turn, come around and go here. And so what you see is, and I'll show you this in a little bit, the return on investment, these different types of scenarios. You see a return on investment that winds up to be very, very low. Lots of space dedicated to parking, buildings very spread out, very high infrastructure cost per foot, and very low return. This is a strode. You, you will find in engineering manuals, uh, and this comes right out of a, 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 one of them, you'll find this kind of uh, strode inducement diagram. Uh, these are, this is the way engineers look at the world. Arterials, these are our big highways, big collector streets, are all about mobility. It's all about roads, moving cars quickly. Uh, local streets are all about land access. That's the street part. And they've got this thing in the middle they're calling collectors here, but it's basically like the hybrid between the two, right? This is our strode land. And in the engineering world, you kind of just step back and say, well, you know, do we want mobility or do we want access? And most cities will say, yes. <laughs> and so you wind up, you know, with this right in here, right? And that's perfectly acceptable. It's one of the acceptable outcomes in the engineering manual. What we have done is turn this on its side and say, okay, oh yeah, note before we go on. Uh, incredibly, uh, very, very high returning investments on both these ends, very low returning. These, these are incredibly expensive environments to build and pay back very little. Uh, to go along with that, these are very safe. Uh, the stuff in the middle here is where all of our horrible accidents happen. When you mix high-speed traffic with complexity, you get tragedy. And that's what we have engineered large amounts of our places to do. What we have done is taken this diagram and, and flipped it on its side and said, okay, let's look at value. Where are we providing the greatest amount of value? When people are driving, and this is speed along this axis here, when people are really slow, we're getting a tremendous amount of value. That's where we're creating all the wealth. That's where our cities are becoming wealthy and prosperous and we can provide the most opportunity. When people are driving really fast, that's when we also provide a lot of value, a high return on investment because we can get people from one place to another very quickly. Where we lose out is when we get in the middle here. That's where we have the least value, uh, where we're building these strodes where we neither can get someplace very fast nor are providing a lot of value. So again, uh, here's where our high returning investments are and our low returning investments are. And just to reiterate, uh, when you're driving really slow, it's very safe. People don't die very often in these environments. And even though sometimes the accident rates uh, 
you know, peak up a little bit at times, they're all fender benders, right? The fatality rates are incredibly, incredibly low. These are also really, really safe environments. When we build highways, we know how to do this. Forgiving design works on the open road. We become very, very good at making these places safe. It's in the middle where we have all the problems. What do we do with our strodes? Uh, and really, this is, from a transportation standpoint, instead of building new highways and building new systems and building new stuff, we, we really need to talk about strode retrofit as the uh, approach that our cities can focus on and need to focus on today if we want to start talking about economic development and return on investment. Um, these concepts are really simple to talk about. They're really hard to do. They're really simple to talk about. They're really hard to do. So I'm going to do the simple today, and then you're going to go back and do the hard. Um, that's not a real fair trade, but I, I want to frame this for you so you can see, because once you get this, it's really, really easy to see. If you have a strode, this hybrid of the two, and you want to make it into a wealth-producing street, what do you do? Well, you slow down the traffic. You prioritize people over automobiles. You intensify the land use pattern. The goal of building wealth is actually having more wealth being built. So you build wealth uh, in these places, and you embrace the complexity of the environment that you're creating. If you want to go the other way and turn your strode into a road and increase your return on investment by that, you go the opposite way, right? You limit access. You uh, segregate your automobiles from other modes so that they can move very, very quickly. Uh, you don't allow the adjacent land use to degrade things. You don't allow an access every 100 feet so you, you, know, you're, you, you don't have economic development along those corridors. You try to simplify, simplify everything. Roads are really easy to understand. If we have two productive places, two places uh, that are, are successful that we want to connect, we connect them with a the road. This has been done for millennia, right? In the modern era, we have cars on them. Roads are very easy to deal with over time because as our places grow and become more successful and we get more traffic, we can add more capacity to the road. When we run out of our ability to simply add capacity because maybe we have right-of-way constraints or what have you, uh, we can also upgrade modes. We can add different you know, modes over time. As these become more used, we can improve them. There's a ton of flexibility when we're connecting productive places. Uh, for dealing with roads and dealing with lots of different users, lots of different people, lots of different uh, levels of traffic and levels of intensity. We know how to do this. We're very, very, very good at it. What we really have a hard time with is building great streets and productive places. And if there's one thing that I can uh, leave you with today, if you leave here with nothing else, leave here with this. Building financially productive streets is more art than science. Building financially productive streets is more art than science. Building a great place is more of an art than a science. I am an engineer. Engineers are very comfortable with code books, with regulations, with manuals that tell you how to do things. We're very comfortable with the science of engineering and building places. If you go to an engineer, they can tell you what the lane width should be, what the setback should be. We, we get that, right? The science of it. But the beauty of great places is not the science. It's the art. It's all the complexity that goes into a place. I want to illustrate this by having you think about the way we used to build places before not only the automobile, but before kind of our modern economic growth and development approach. This is my hometown. I live two and a half hours north of Minneapolis-St. Paul today. This is what it looked like in 1870. Uh, just a little railroad stop out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, some people put up little pop-up shacks, kind of the cheapest building you could put in, just to get things started, right? A little experiment. Uh, we built thousands of these around this country. Many of them failed. When they failed, did we have to have Wall Street bailouts? Did we have to have you know, stock market crashes and unemployment soaring? No. People made little tiny bets. They lost. They salvaged what they could, and they move on. But a lot of times, these places were successful. These little bets would pay off. It would become a place that would build and build and build. 
And when they would grow, they would grow in a very predictable way. They would grow incrementally, incrementally up, incrementally out, and become incrementally more intense. So after 30 years, this little uh, stretch of pop-up shacks would become this street here. It's the exact same street in 1904, so 34 years later. Two and three-story wood structures, which in another 40 years would be replaced by buildings that were brick and granite facade. Again, incremental growth over time, small little growth, small little changes over a broad area over a long period of time. This is how cities have historically built wealth. It can't be engineered. There's not a manual to do this. It takes the complexity of literally an infinite number of interactions between people, having commerce, having places they live, falling in love, listening to good bands, going to good restaurants, finding a better job. The myriad of complexity that goes into this is, is unfathomable. But this platform for doing it, the traditional way of building cities, uh, adapted to all that. Let me show you how productive this approach is. These are two identical blocks in my hometown. The one on the left I've labeled old and blighted. The one on the right I've labeled shiny and new. You'll see that they're the exact same size, exact same area. They have the same amount of public infrastructure. Everything about them is the same except for the style of development. That old block looks like this. It's the pop-up block of the 1930s. When my city was growing, this was the edge of town in the 1930s. This was the cheapest block they could have built at that period of time. If things had continued on as they had for millennia, uh, this would have gotten, you know, over time, a second story, a third story, become more intense. That's not what happened, right? Uh, after this was built, we had the Depression, we had World War II, we had a completely different style of development, just leapfrogged over this. These places have stagnated for 90 years. Two blocks over used to look just like this. Uh, we got it torn down, and now we have a drive-through taco joint. Um, Double drive-through lanes, ample parking, highway sign, you know, the whole thing is modern. Everybody was thrilled about this transaction, right? We got rid of blight, we got something brand new, we got a better investment. The only problem is nobody stopped to look at what happened to the tax base. That old and blighted block, the value of $1.1 million, that shiny new block, same size, same area, is only valued at 800000 Understand what you're looking at. You're looking at the traditional style of development in that old block, the way we built around the world for thousands and thousands of years. In its infancy, after 90 years of neglect, and it still outperforms by a wide margin the stuff we're building routinely today. And not only that, we all know the trajectory of the taco joint, right? We've all been around long enough to see, you know, 20 years from now, this will be a used car lot, right? 10 years later, we'll be boarded up. We'll be trying to get a grant to get it torn down and get something new built in there, right? We've all been around long enough to see this. In fact, when we did this analysis in 2012, uh, these were the numbers, but we updated it last summer. And here's what's happened in the two subsequent years. The traditional development pattern uh, is incredibly productive financially. We see this in the middle of town. We see this out on the edge of town. This is our Mills Fleet Farm. It's a kind of Midwestern Home Depot, like big box store. This is the store. There's an auto dealership there and a gas station. This is a 20-acre piece of property, most valuable piece of property in the entire area. This is 20 acres of our core downtown. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Fargo, you've seen a not-so-flattering but not-so-inaccurate portrayal of my hometown. Uh, the downtown, it's, uh, you know, most of the second, third stories are abandoned, unoccupied. A lot of the first stories are as well. Lots of parking. We have a lot of buildings that are burnt down and replaced with parking lots. Yet when we look at these 20 acres, uh, just different development patterns, we see out on the edge of town we're getting $0.6 million per acre of wealth created. Downtown, the same amount of acreage, just a different style, has a value of $1.1 million per acre. We're getting 78% more taxes in the 20 acres we have downtown than the 20 acres we have out on the edge. And the 20 acres we had downtown, uh, that was stuff that was built slowly and incrementally by my great-great-grandparents and their contemporaries. The stuff out on the edge, we have spent hundreds of millions of dollars to get. 
I, as an engineer, I designed the road behind this building. That was two and a half million. The bypass was 150 million. We spent 30 million to get the sewer out there, another 20 million to get the water out there. The county has spent millions of dollars on the, the county road on the, the, the bottom there. Slow and incremental is massively, massively productive. Um, let me just show you. A friend of mine named Joe Minicosi does these great 3D renderings. Uh, what I'm going to show you is value per acre. Think of a farm field, and if you look at a farm field, what a farmer is interested in is what parts of my field yield the most crops per acre. We're looking at the same thing here. We're looking at the value per acre, how much wealth is being created per acre of property. Uh, this is Buffalo, New York. So I, I included a couple of New York examples here. Uh, this is Buffalo. Uh, this is what it looks like. You can kind of pick out the traditional downtown, right? Um, the thing to look at here is not just how much wealth is in that traditional downtown, but just how much wealthier it is than everything that is around it. This development pattern uh, is incredibly, incredibly productive. When we look at, here's Williamsville, uh, we see the same kind of thing in their traditional downtown. We have hundreds of these places around the country where we see the same thing over and over. This is a little city by where I live, population about 800. Uh, when I went to uh, meet with the city for the first time, they said, Chuck, uh, we have some great stuff going on out on the edge of town, uh, out here and uh, down here, some really great high quality development. We've gotten some economic development grant money and we're doing some great stuff. Uh, but our neighborhoods here are really struggling. We've got to find a way to replace this stuff uh, with the great stuff that's going on out here. And then we showed them where all their wealth was. And it's in those neighborhoods that they devalue. It's in the neighborhoods where the poor people live, right? It's in the neighborhoods where uh, they discount the little shops and the little businesses and the people who are trying to make a go of it. Because they'd rather have the brand new hotel out on the edge or the brand new subway out on the edge. But they're not figuring where their wealth actually is. We have built uh, in this country some amazing, amazing cities uh, that were financially really potent places. Uh, and we have spent the last 60, 70 years slowly ripping that potency apart. Uh, this is a, a map that Joe uh, put together for a study that him and I did in Lafayette. We're not done with it. Lafayette, Louisiana, we're not done with it. Um, we're still going to go back in November. And, and, but this is kind of preliminary where we're at. Oh, I realize that you can't see this real well. Um, I'll give you the 10 second version since you can't get a lot of the nuance here. Um, the green is where they're making money. The red is where they're losing money. The greener it is and the taller it is, the more money they're making. The redder it is, the more money they're losing. Green is their traditional downtown, their poor neighborhoods around their downtown, and this new urbanist development that went in out on the edge, uh, uh, out on the edge of the downtown. Now, Delta Lafayette, it's a nice place. You know, it's got that feel a little bit like the French Quarter in New Orleans, uh, but not, you know, it doesn't exude wealth, right? Kind of run down. The, the neighborhood adjacent where all the poor people live certainly does not exude wealth. Yet those are the places where they're making a lot of money as a city. Why, why is that? Because when the people came there and moved there, they built on the high ground. They built on the best place. We, we had one map for them. We showed them. If you flush your toilet in this neighborhood, it doesn't get, it just goes to the treatment facility because it's all gravity. If you flush your, neighbor, your toilet in this neighborhood, it gets to get it pumped 23 times before it gets to the treatment facility. They both pay the same rate, right? One costs you a tremendous amount, the other one costs you hardly anything. These are the things that we have not pondered. So out here, what's out here? All the brand new suburban subdivisions, the mall, the strip malls, all this stuff out here where they're bleeding red, uh, that's the stuff that they're losing tons of money on. And they're losing money largely because they have spent and obligated themselves, more importantly, to maintain miles and miles and miles of infrastructure that has very, very low return on investment. The moral of the story here is pretty simple. The indicator species of success is not the automobile, it's people. Where you see people you see wealth. Where you see people, you see success. 
when you can attract the indicator species of the human, you are actually producing a place that is going to be financially productive and prosperous. And so as cities, I realize we live in this crazy world with all these incentives to do all these ridiculously destructive things. But if we can just simplify it down to doing small, basic things uh, incrementally over time focused on people, we can make huge, huge strides. And I, I, I want to close by framing this to all of you in a way uh, to kind of push back on what your engineers are going to tell you. Because when you, when you go to an engineer and say, we want to build a place for people, right? Uh, they'll say, okay, we've got, a, I, we've got an idea. It's called Complete Streets. How many of you have heard of Complete Streets, right? Complete Streets is great, right? Uh, because without Complete Streets, um, you know, it's just all automobiles. So Complete Streets, uh, engineers love this because it doesn't challenge their paradigm at all, right? We can still have the cars, and the cars can still go fast, and the cars can still dominate, but we'll continue to over-engineer to design something for everybody, right? So bikers have a place, pedestrians have a place, buses have a place, everybody has their place, and that fits within our paradigm. Um, I'm not saying complete streets is all bad, but I'm gonna challenge you to think a little bit beyond it, because what complete streets does uh, is it doesn't really move your mental paradigm far enough. Complete streets accommodate people within an auto-dominated environment. Productive places, places that are successful, accommodate automobiles within an environment dominated by people. That is a subtle linguistic difference, but a massive difference in terms of our orientation towards building great places. When we build for people, when we design places that are scaled, when we use the art of building great places, not the science of building streets, what we find is that we can spend a lot less money and build places that are a lot more successful. That's our challenge. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to, to chat with you and take questions. Our website is strongtowns.org. We still do a blog every weekday. We do a podcast once a week. If you go on our site today, uh, this week is our membership drive, so you're going to be bombarded with asks to become a member of our organization. If you want to do that, I would be very flattered. Uh, but if you tune in next Monday, we'll be back to regular programming. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.